humans have always learned to overcome problems with the help of a simple process, trial and error. But unless this information learned is retained, trial and error will always reach a dead end. Networks are what enable us to process and disseminate this information. Several million years ago, our ancestors were experimenting with their own versions of trial and error. Whether this involved the food they ate or tools they used, it was the network of neurons in their brains that allowed them to learn from their endeavors and ultimately continue to evolve. Over many generations, as our communication skills improved, we grew another kind of network that facilitated learning at the community level, social networks. Fueled by our capacity to communicate, suddenly, if one person learned something, the whole group could share in that information. Now we started to develop on a new timescale. Within just a few thousand years of community level problem solving, human population growth began to explode. Unfortunately, our rapid expansion has bred a whole new generation of problems. A series of global issues are threatening all of society, and the scary truth is that we no longer have millions of years to adapt. We have only decades. So, is it possible for humankind to overcome these global scale problems in a matter of years? We believe it is, and by drawing on the same principles we've always used. We use machine learning to perform rapid trial and error calculations that take place billions of times faster than human learning. And to process this information, we work with a vast network of thousands of ecologists from around the world. By allowing us to detect global patterns from local observations, these networks help us to understand Earth's capacity to store carbon. With these basic principles, we hope to generate a rapid ecological understanding that can inspire a global restoration movement to address the threats of biodiversity loss and climate change. We all want to get involved in the fight against climate change, every single one of us here. And doing so requires that we understand the scale of the challenge and also understand what contribution we as individuals can have. Because our atmosphere is incredibly thin. It's analogous to the width of the rubber around a balloon. And every year we emit 10 gigatons of carbon into that space. Now some goes into the, la into the land, some into the ocean, but a large chunk remains in the atmosphere and it's building up every single year. So we've accumulated over 300 gigatons in our atmosphere which is constantly ticking up and warming our planet. Of course, preventing this increase by reducing fossil fuel emissions is our highest priority in the fight against climate change. But if we want to draw down some of this carbon that currently exists, we need an immensely powerful system. And there's no system more powerful that we're aware of than the natural system. This is a beautiful NASA simulation of the carbon cycle, showing high concentrations of carbon at the beginning of the year indicated by red. But as we tick on into spring and then summer, you'll see these concentrations fade. And that's caused by one thing. It's the emergence of leaves on trees. This simple ecological process transforms our carbon cycle every year, and it's one of several massive fluxes that balance one another out. Given the massive scale of this system, I don't think anyone would argue that managing it effectively must be among our options and our brightest options in the fight against climate change. But it's never been a tangible option. It's the happy, clappy, plant a tree, save the world. It's never been really part of the climate change agenda for the simple reason we haven't had a quantitative understanding about what's possible. If we look at the top climate change solutions, Project Drawdown lists them in terms of carbon storage. Refrigerant management, if we were to maximize the efficiency of our, efficiency of our refrigerant management, we could save 24 gigatons by 2050, with an amazing impact on climate change. But the value of global restoration is entirely unclear, so its ecosystems are broken down into small parts and listed way below the top solutions. Who's going to invest our genuine time and money and effort into this climate change solution until we know what contribution we can have? 
So obviously the big thing is, the big challenge is that the Earth's massive. It's hard to characterize all of these ecosystems. So we've, we've relied heavily on satellites, which have fantastic global coverage. And they've estimated that in, we're in the order of 400 billion trees exist on our planet. But they can't see below the canopy surface to see the structure of those forests. So we've been developing a new generation of model, this time built from the bottom up, using millions of observations where people have been standing on the ground estimating the number of trees. And they also estimate the size of those trees and the species identity, which helps us to understand how the structure of those forests varies across those points. And by linking it with climate and topo topographic information and soil characteristics, we can start to see the patterns. Then using simple machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can extend those patterns across the globe to reveal the patterns in tree density that show that there are in, in the order of about three trillion trees on the planet. Not only does that transform our understanding of the scale of this system, but because we know the size of every one of those trees, it starts to give us insights into the carbon storage. So we can see that those ecosystems, forests around the world, store about 600 gigatons of carbon. Now, these models are fantastic for characterizing where ecosystems are, and they're getting more and more predictive power, but they don't just tell us where they are now. We can also start to get insights into the potential, where, which environments can support trees, and therefore where trees would exist in the absence of humans. And we see there's room for vastly more forests that would exist in the absence of human activity. But obviously we are here, and forests cover a lot of this land, as does urban land and agricultural land. But when we remove those land use types, we're left with the degraded lands. These are the 0.9 billion hectares around the world where trees would naturally exist under today's climate, but they don't because of previous human activity. These would store about, uh, just around about a trillion trees, so it's about a third of the amount we've got on, this, on the planet right now. And we estimated that if those trees were to accumulate and to, if we could help facilitate them to grow and restore across these regions, they could store an additional 100 to 200 gigatons of carbon that would be taken out of the atmosphere and, 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 uh, and changing ocean concentrations. That is a huge uncertainty, but it's also, however you look at it, an incredibly powerful carbon drawdown solution that would only take place over 100 years. It would be well more than 100 years before we, full, full, we, would, we would fully reach that potential. But the second those trees are in the ground, they're immediately photosynthesizing and drawing carbon from the atmosphere. And they're also producing clouds. And in the tropical regions, those reflect a lot of the sun's energy with an immediate cooling impact. So when we launched this information six months ago, the world went viral. It exploded. Suddenly, trees and ecosystems were right at the top of the climate change agenda and involved in all of the conversations. It had some fantastic impact. There's the, like the, the amount of national and international policy agreements that have been launched is countless. And we've been seeing huge spikes in funding for restoration that are followed by loads of restoration projects dotting up all over the world. And these are just the few that we work with. We're aware of thousands of others that we haven't had, had full contact with. So it's all brilliant, except social media had other ideas, and as did a lot of the scientific world. Because with anything this powerful, it starts to get political. And when you, when you sift through all the considerations, you realize that there are some really important critics, critiques that come out on this, in this topic. It's not as simple as all this. The first criticism, that's so stupid, we received this moments after the paper came out. That's so stupid, we can't just plant trees, we need emissions cuts. While I don't absolutely love the introduction, I have to agree, this is absolutely correct. Of course, you could cover the planet in trees and we're not going to stop climate change without cuts to emissions. Climate change is way too big to be squabbling over solutions. We absolutely need all of them. The next criticism, no, we need to conserve existing forests. Now this, for fear of repeating myself, I have to agree entirely, it's hard to disagree. Global restoration doesn't mean replacing old forests with new forests. It's absolutely vital that we conserve the existing forests that we currently have and try to turn the tide so that we're gaining forests rather than losing them. So of course they're both necessary. And the final criticism is that we also need other ecosystems like grasslands, savannas, and that is abundantly obviously true. The point of doing this study is to find the regions where forests can exist, not 
identify that they should, they should exist everywhere. We, we can identify where they should not be restored. Because these ecosystems are vital also for carbon storage and biodiversity. But the carbon is not stored in their vegetation. In these ecosystems, it's primarily stored below ground. So we've been building the next stage of our models, this time not based on observations of trees, but on thousands and thousands of soil samples. Then using the same artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can extrapolate those patterns in soil carbon to reveal that there's in the order of 1,500 gigatons in this enormous carbon stock. And these are distributed primarily at the high latitude regions where cold conditions have slowed down decomposition. And so if we want to capture carbon in forests and in vegetation, the tropics are certainly the place to focus. But if we want to capture it in the, high lat in, in the soil, the high latitudes are absolutely a really high priority region. But again, these models don't just tell us where soil, where soil carbon is now. John Sanderman was able to use similar approaches to show that there's room for an extra 116 gigatons of carbon just in the world soil. And this is across all ecosystem types. Forests, of course, are an important role. So by conserving and protecting them, we can capture about 30% of that. But grasslands and savannah co savannas cover an, even, cover an even larger extent. And they could capture about 39% of that excess carbon in the soil. And that doesn't necessarily come at the expense of any other land use type. You can have really successful agriculture and accumulate carbon to promote your productivity. And the most efficient of those ecosystems is actually the wetlands and the peatlands. These cover less than 5% of that Earth's surface, but cap could capture a staggering 31% of that potential. So just focusing on these tiny regions can have an incredibly powerful impact. So putting it back into context, context, we can see that these natural ecosystems certainly have an incredibly powerful role to play in carbon drawdown and should be certainly part of the agenda alongside the thousands of other climate change solutions that are absolutely critical. But of course, once again, with anything as powerful as this, there's huge risks. Too many restoration projects at the moment fail because they plant trees in the wrong areas or they use the wrong species that cannot be supported by that microbial community. So we've, and not only does this mean that you're wasting time and va valuable time and energy, but it can actually be really damaging to local biodiversity. And this is the source of a huge amount of the concern in the political agenda. So we spend a lot of our time and energy generating maps, maps that can show restoration projects, how many trees to restore in an area, which species of trees and how many species. You can even get insights into the microbial community to see which species can be supported. And you can even begin to calculate whether ecosystems would have a warming or a cooling impact on the climate around the world. But even more important than this ecological context is the social context. Because ecosystems are intrinsically linked to the people that live there. Too many times, restoration projects come in and they buy up an area of land and they plant trees and exclude the local community. Not only is that socially irresponsible, but it's completely unsustainable because that, those, that community will just come back and cut down the trees and use it for their livelihoods, as we would. Restoration only works when it's done in combination with that local community so that the funding goes towards that community and all of the ecosystem services that those ecosystems provide and the vitality that can come to the, to the local agricultural systems. When done right, restoration can have huge socioeconomic impacts on those local communities. And the best of those projects that I mentioned earlier are doing exactly this. And the best of them are doing so for as little as 30 cents a tree. So to put that in context, if we were to manage to scale that up impossibly to the en entire globe, we could, capture our, we could restore our one trillion trees for as little as $300 billion. Obviously, that's not a realistic number. It's impossible to scale that. But it puts in context just how simple this is relative to the trillions of dollars that we lose every single year on climate change. So this really is the, a low-tech low-cost option that can engage all of our energy by three simple mechanisms, plant or conserve trees. And you can zoom in on our maps and see which species should be restored or, or, or protected in different areas. Or simply donate to one of the thousands of projects that are out there doing fantastic work right now. Or even at the lowest level of, of engagement, just investing your money wisely in the organizations that have a positive environmental impact rather than a, ne rather than a negative one can shape markets to have a really powerful and tangible impact on biodiversity loss and climate change. 
Which brings me to the final criticism, the final concern. This sounds great, but it's just naive. We'll never restore the entire globe. Once again, while I can't say it's wrong, in this case, I'd have to say that this is entirely irrelevant. It's like saying, if we can't achieve 100%, let's not even bother. It's this kind of negativity and concern about climate change that drives our inaction. Because if we achieved even 5% of our goals, the impacts for biodiversity and, and human well-being would be incredible. I just hope the people saying it can't be done don't interrupt the incredible people that are already doing it. So we certainly are one of the first societies facing the real threat of climate change. But with the technology, the solutions, and the energy and drive that we have, we're also one of the first societies that has a real chance to do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you.